Hello friends, we are going to do some replay analysis here to take a look at how the guide applies to real life games, take some closer looks at stuff because when I talk about the guides it's a little more general and now we can see it a bit more specifically. First we're going to look at sketchy guy here who, oh just like a real YouTuber, where is it? I'll put the comment here, whoa. Anyways, he left a comment and originally I was just going to do one game but I thought it would be a good way to compare different lanes. Uh, as a way to take a look at our talk on identifying what kind of lane we're playing, what our objective is, and then how we're going to itemize towards that and how we're going to play the lane out. So I, uh, ta-da, oh, I block you. Okay, you don't need to see me, it's fine. We're going to quickly go over this and then we'll go take a look at each game, focusing very quickly on the early game because we have to cover three. So first, Sketchy Guy's playing Grimstroke. He's very new to the hero relatively. I think you had about 10 games. So I don't blame you for doing the same item build each time. I think that's uh, fine to do when you are learning a new hero, just doing the same start. Um, but now that you've, you're at a, like about 10 games, you're starting to get the feel of him, let's think about how we can start to specialize our items based on our lane. So first, Grimstroke as a hero himself is kind of weird, where it really depends on who your matchup partner is, because what makes you good in lane is your ink swell. And if your teammate does not have a good way to get on top of them with Inkswell or to do damage during Inkswell, then it becomes a very lackluster spell. And, you know, if you can't really use it, then what do you do? You just Stroke of Fate creeps, which pushes the lane, so that's not really that great. So we can just use it to hit the range creep. And then what else? It, it becomes very awkward. Now, he's going to be good later in the game, of course, but in the laning stage, it's, it feels a little weird. So how strong your lane is very much depends on your partner. So in this first game, PA, I would say PA is an average laner. She's good in some cases, bad in other times. Together, I would say you're an average lane because PA has a good way to deliver ink swell by just blinking on top of the hero. So that's very good. Um, and the both of you have a poking spell in the form of Stroke of Fate and then the, uh, the dagger from PA. And that way you can kind of chip down the enemy. And then when you decide they're low enough, Inkswell me, she jumps in, kills them. Um, so that combo is decent. But against certain heroes, it's harder. So for example, against Mars, because he has Spear to just push you away after you jump in and then your Inkswell does nothing, you know, it's not going to be nearly as good. So in this particular matchup, I'd say it's leaning towards the weaker side, but still average. Now in this next one, you have a Spectre, who's notoriously a weak laner. She doesn't really ever initiate the fight, right? If the support manages to get the enemy low enough for somehow um, that she can get a kill by daggering in, she'll, go she'll do it. But that's not really what she cares about. She's just there to get last hits and experience. She doesn't need to go on the enemy, which makes it very awkward with your Inkswell, like we just talked about. And then finally, you have Slark. And I would say this is a great matchup um, because Slark is a very strong laner early. It depends on the matchup a bit, but in general, Slark is very strong uh, because of his passive. And because he has Pounce, between the two of you, that is two forms of crowd control that give Slark a lot of time to hit people. And the, the longer he can hit people consecutively because of his passive, the better it is. So you slow them and he can hit them. You put your Inkswell on him so that you know, he's faster and can chase them down and hit them. It stuns, he can hit them, and then he has his pounce, say this is level two, and then he can hit them even more. And during all of that, you're auto-attacking, and then, you know, at the end, maybe you can use Stroke of Fate again. Um, it just ends up being a very powerful combo when combined with Slark. And if Slark is not near them, you can use Inkswell on him, then he pounces to get to them. That provides a bit of time. You know, there's a bit more overlap in that situation, but you know what? It's still okay. Um, let's take a look at the enemy side. Mars and Witch Doctor are a strong lane. Queen of Pain and Chen are a strong lane, but for different reasons. Mars and Witch Doctor are going to burst you down, 100 to 0. That's their goal. And it's possible with Maledict, where ideally you put Maledict first, but any time near the beginning would be fine. And then they're going to chain stun you. You know, cask into spear and then a slow afterwards, or maybe reverse it. He slows to land the spear, and then cask after that, and they're going to be auto-attacking you the whole time. And then Maledict will chunk you down. Because you lost so much health after it got applied, that is what kills you. It's the Maledict. They're not really a lineup that just whittles you down, necessarily. Yeah, they'll try to harass and auto-attack you to make their kill easier, 
but it's not really like what they do. The exact opposite of that would actually be Venomancer. But Queen of Pain is very close. Where Queen of Pain is going to cast her own dagger on you frequently. It lasts a very long time. And it does, you know, a moderate amount of damage each time. So she's going to slowly whittle you down, hitting you with her auto attack, hitting you with her poison dagger. Um, and it's just going to take a long time, uh, you know, before you get in range of getting a kill. But it's going to get there because her spells are better than your regen in general. And Chen is kind of in that same vein where he auto attacks. His auto attack is decent. Um, but what really gets you is his regen, his amplified aura regen, which just makes him and his laner more efficient when they're trading with you. And so by constantly auto attacking, constantly using this uh, spell, her dagger on you, you slowly get weaker, and then you reach this point where you know you're too low to approach the lane, and if you do, they kill you by just auto attacking. And then finally, this last lane. This lane's weak. Pudge is a really weak laner, and Death Prophet as an off laner is kind of awkward. Where I think she just needs levels to be efficient, and splitting levels with Pudge, like not. It is the opposite of being efficient and getting quick levels. So. Her, her her spirit siphon is kind of strong in the lane, but I don't think you have to worry that much about it. So I feel like you guys could kill them uh, very easily. So quickly looking at itemizations, for this last lane, I'm okay with your items. Because you're a strong lane, you can benefit from this efficiency of Sage's Mask, and they don't really have a way to like cancel your clarity. I'm cool with that. I might trade out this Iron Branch for a Mango, because when you want to fight, you want to make sure you can use all your spells. Grimstroke is that kind of hero where he uses all his spells every time he fights. So I, I might like having a mango so that you have that extra burst of mana right when you need it. But overall, I'm okay with this. And I like that you have a ward for uh, Pudge. I actually, I will say, I don't think you need the sentry. I think that sentry could be your mango, for example. And then you could start with all the same stuff. Um, possibly even selling this branch and getting two mangoes so that, you know, you can do your combo, try to get a kill. If you don't, that's okay. In a little bit, you can do it again because you have another mango, if need be. Uh, I don't think you need a sentry because like, you don't really have to pull. Or like, if you can't pull, it's not the worst. You'll still want to pull, but if you can't pull, you'll just be like, okay, let's just look to kill them then. And then later, you can get the sentry and deward the pull camp if they did that. Um, in the specter lane, I like the sentry. It's very important to be able to pull in general. But actually against Chen, you're going to use it to block the small camp. I'll talk more about that in the game, but I'm okay with this sentry ward. And I might actually consider starting with a headdress in this game or building towards it. So like buying a ring of regen and then buying a headdress right after. Because again, how they win this lane is by just slowly whittling you down. And Spectre is a hero that just needs to farm. So you don't need to have a bunch of mana in this lane necessarily to you know, be ready to, oh, let's... Go on them, Inkswell, Q, everything. You just need to survive the lane and let her farm. And I think a headdress would help you do that because it gives more regen to survive all of this. And then she'll win you the game later. For PA, I'm mostly okay with your items, but I think a salve would be good so that if they try to burst you and then fail, you know, if you only have tangos, it's still going to take you a really long time to heal up. And if you approach the lane, then they don't need to use all their spells. They can just like stun you once and they might get the kill um, by having the salve so that after they fail their combo you can salve up then if they want to go on you again they have to commit all of their spells and that's less cost efficient for them like a salve is only 110 gold to essentially get to full health and they would need to use um, a bunch of mangoes for them to each cast their spells or maybe you know take a lot of time with a clarity but then they have to play more passively so you don't just break it with stroke of fate um, yeah, I just think having a salve would be really nice. Or having multiple branches to give yourself some extra stats so bursting you is harder, that would be fine too. So let's actually now go into the game. We spent about 10 minutes on this, but uh, yeah, let's go. Okay, here we are, first game. This is with the PA. I believe this PA is your friend, or at least you're partied up. And uh, I think you played the Slart game with him as well, and then the Spectres alone. Left lane about, or left the fountain as soon as you could, pretty much. So happy with that. Coming out here, doing a bit of scouting. In this lane in particular, I would let PA. Oh, she, 
So usually I wouldn't skill it up yet. Like PA could be out here a bit more. And if they suddenly jump her and you're a bit further back, then she can blink to you and be safe. And not having dagger level one in lane can be a problem. But at the same time, you'll hit level two soon enough. And it's like manageable, especially if it keeps you alive. But having said that, it wasn't a really big deal. I think this is totally fine what you guys are doing so far. Now I will say for you, Inkswell can be a very good level 1 spell to take. In this case, I'm okay with uh, Stroke of Fate, but Inkswell is very good for contesting runes like this because like, you see how both of them are here. So you would just stun them or at least do a lot of damage, make them uh, hesitant to approach the lane. So I'm actually going to point out how... So you, you attempted to do this, right? So you... And you did do it mostly right. So you scouted it, you saw it. This is a decent place to meet. Now, because he aggros these creeps, the way creep aggro works is that... Here, we'll slow it down so we can see this when I unpause. The way creep aggro works is they just kind of chase whatever is closest to them. Um, and when things lose focus on them, they, they first prioritize anything that hits them and then anything that um, is close. So in this case, that range creep hit this one. Let's play that again. Sorry. Here we go. Okay. This range creep hit him, which aggros this creep to the range creep while these two try to chase these guys. Because these creeps are not hitting this creep anymore, and that's why he no longer cares about them. Um, but this one hit him, and that's why he's going to run out like this. What you need to do right now, and I didn't really cover this in a video, so to be fair, you know, you guys didn't know. Someone needs to meet this creep and hit him to take aggro and not let it come under tower. Or walk up, auto attack them so that your creeps aggro to you and then just walk forward still and then de-aggro on these creeps again that way the lane doesn't really push because these creeps were not attacking anything and these creeps were not attacking anything and it does shift a little bit further up in the wave but like still here versus here still pretty safe for you whereas this creep coming under tower is ultimately going to lead you guys up to here and in fact it's going to lead to your friend's first death uh, in the long term and we're gonna see how that all starts with this one creep walking here you could say that is a little bit of a stretch but you know what i'm gonna show you i'm gonna show you how it goes so because he de-aggroed these creeps on the range creep and because this one went under the tower you see your lane pushing fairly hard it's not too bad right now but ultimately it will end up three to one you used a tango on this tree, but I would recommend using this tree because right now, see how Witch Doctor can just attack you for free. And in fact, I think if we... Oops, not that one. This one. Uh, let's just watch from your perspective. So, you see how when he's over here, he can choose to attack you whenever he wants now because he has vision of you from these creeps and uh, Mars. But you cannot see him, so you can never be the one to attack first. By breaking this tree and letting yourself, like, peek out here, you kind of remove that advantage. Where if you stand over here, the creeps won't see you, especially if you're, uh, like, standing where this tree is. Um, there's kind of this wall so that he won't see you if he's standing here and the creeps won't see you. And then you can peek your head out and you'll auto-attack each other at the same time. Whereas now, see, he auto-attacks you for free. And, uh... Like, now you can see him because he landed an auto attack, but, like, you can't really react, and he just gets free two free auto attacks off on you. And the same thing. He managed to get one off this time, so I guess that one wasn't free. But that's kind of what happens when you're forced to play in this area, and he's allowed to play in the Fog of War. Now, again, because creeps got pulled under, under tower, this is going to, like, make it even worse. Like, this is how hard you guys are pushing, if you'll notice. And now you're going to leave the safety of this general area, which was very safe because it's very difficult to land a spear. Like, imagine where Mars was. Mars was standing here. PA was standing here. How does he land a spear? He only pushes PA back under her own tower. He would have to stand, like, way over here or, like, way over here, and that would be super obvious. But now when this lane pushes forward, look, right now he could spear her if he wanted to, and they're just standing where their creeps are because... Because of this uh, very slight difference where, yeah, if he was standing here, pushing her down is a little hard. 
But now it's not so weird to stand on either side of this area, which opens up spearing on this way, and that opens up the kill combo. Now, I would have actually also liked you to pull this camp because I don't think you know it yet, but these are kobolds, and they are absolutely awful at killing creeps. You're going to pull them on the next wave, actually. I'll finish talking about it when you do that, actually. So let's pay attention to what you're doing. You could have pulled this camp. So at a, at this time is when you would head over to the camp to start pulling. And let's see what you are doing at this time. The answer is you're not going to do a lot because you have a bunch of creeps and we already know what's going to happen. She will be able to auto attack this creep for the last hit and then she can dagger this creep. Um, you are not needed right now. And they are not going to do anything because of look how many creeps you have. They can't fight you evenly right now. So right now you would go ahead to do a pull I would recommend, because it's a kobold camp, I would try to just literally only get this range creep. That's a little hard to do. If you could get the last two creeps, that would be okay, just to delay the push a bit. But even these two creeps will kill off an entire kobold camp. Whereas if you just get the range creep, you can get it low enough to deny if you're lucky. Um, but the more important part is, this camp would die, and then it can respawn at the two minute mark. So let's see, right now you trade a couple auto attacks, which... Like, okay, but you could be pulling. And then you're not doing anything here. You'll notice PA is fine alone this whole time because, like we said, they have so many creeps, you can just stagger. Standing here is a little awkward. You have to be really conscientious. I'll say this because I think you'll tell your friend or maybe your friend will watch it. Where you have to be really conscious when you're playing against Mars of, like, standing near trees. So you need to constantly stand in an area that is not near or, like, is in a direct pathway. Like, always draw a line between you and Mars and realize, like, that is where the spear comes from. And if there's anything on the other side of you, that is a bad spot to be in. So this line is bad, but like this line is okay because it just pushes you out. And I'm saying that with your friend here as an example, but that, that applies to you too if you're in the lane as a support. So this whole time you're not, you haven't done anything in lane. So you would have been able to pull that first one. Now you're going to pull this one. Now we'll see how everything's going to die here. Keep attention to the lane. PA is still okay. You'll notice how almost no damage was dealt. This creep is the closest to dying, and it's not even in deny range. The kobold camp is awful, especially when you have this many creeps attacking it at once. That's why it's really important to do a half pull with this camp if you're trying to deny anything. Um, but also, look, just the way the game works, when you pull at 148, you're not able to stack. And now that this camp is dead, you cannot use this camp for another minute. Um, until it respawns at 3. Whereas if you had pulled it before, it would have died and then respawned, and now you could do another pull, um, say, with this creep wave. But I do like what you try to do, which is you try to do this as a direct result. But notice... So you're trying to do this to control the wave, which I am okay with. But if you think of the ideal pull, it is to accomplish two things. It is to control the wave, but it is also to try to get a gold and XP advantage, right? Either by denying creeps to the enemies or by securing the gold and XP from these creeps. So although this pull helps to balance out your creep wave, they are within range once they realize what you've done and they like shift over to stand over here. They are in range to get XP from both lane creeps and the creeps killing these. So you're not denying any experience, not anything like different than say denying it here where no one is in range for any experience. Um, and then they're also going to split the golden XP or at least the experience from this large camp with you guys and potentially the gold, depending who gets the last hits. I would say you are probably favored to get the last hit if you use your spell. Whereas uh, he also could have a decent chance with the God's Rebuke. Or maybe you guys just auto attack for it. But either way, I just want to point out how this is losing the other benefit of the pull, which is trying to get that XP advantage. You're just now evenly splitting it. And I would say that them, the enemy offlane, at an equal level is ahead of you guys because of how we talked about Maldict is the burst kill. So you know what? Just giving him extra stun duration and damage, that's just going to make his kill threat even greater. Giving this guy more burst damage is just going to amplify Maldict as well, and that is going to make their kill threat greater pa is not a hero that has a large health pool and her strength gain is moderate but the damage they get from their spells is going to be more than the extra health pool that she gets so 
being even in this lane is not ideal. Now I'm still okay with this because you're trying to control the wave, but just note how you're doing this pull because this camp is dead and you're not able to do a small camp pull. Whereas if you had pulled it at the 118 mark and now you could do another two minute pull with this wave and instead have, and just let this wave walk through, like that would have been better. And because of this, uh, you're gonna trade harass a bit. Note that he used Maledict. Maledict is a really long cooldown. When Maledict is down and they don't get a kill, you should feel fairly safe in the lane. Um, so I actually think coming up here, slow down look how much dagger does to this guy so this is why i think you guys should be chipping him down with dagger and then i think this is the kill right here once dagger is up again your spells together if you this is the combination you're going to do you're going to stroke a fate him she's going to dagger you're going to ink swell her she's going to blink on him and auto attack and the time between ink swell cast and blinking should be fairly close so um We'll assume most of the damage from Inkswell goes on this guy, which is combined, these two spells, is about like 220 damage considering the uh, magic resistance. And then Stifling Dagger is doing like 70 damage to this guy because he only has two armor. So 220 plus 70 is already 300, which is most of his health. Then the Blink gives attack speed, which is a lot of auto attacks, and your her damage is pretty decent at the start. Um, now he does have a magic stick and a fairy fire, but again, that is just like four or five more auto attacks from you two, which should include the fact that this is going to stun him and give you a chance to just auto attack him for free. Now granted he is like, this is still on cooldown. Um, these are both pretty long cooldown spells level one. Now this is getting close and it will be up by the time you have stifling dagger, but maledict would still be down. Now I don't expect you guys to know exactly like we have eight seconds to go unless you're like really paying attention to the time he uses it. But I think you should have this feeling that Maledict is a long cooldown spell at the start and that you have this window of opportunity. And even if he stuns and uses God's Rebuke, rebuke and then they cast Paralyzing Cask, without Maledict, it's probably not a kill. And then I think you can kill this guy and then salve up afterwards. Because you don't go on him, he is going to stay around healthy enough. And now it's going to lead to the kill here. Where, unfortunately, this is part of knowing neutral camp abilities. We briefly talked about this in the mechanics. Where both of you walked up to this camp. Which, combined with this, gave three targets. And that's why he triggered it triggered his War Stomp. Which sets up a very easy stun for Mars. And at this point, your PA is dead. I think you just have to know that. Um, because now, like, their two stuns and Maledict was enough to kill PA. And they just got a free third stun to set this up. I would ink swell yourself or one of these creeps because PA is dead and she's going to die before ink swell can do anything for her. Um, alternatively, you could walk further away from her and hope that they don't perfectly chain stun her and that she'll be able to phantom strike to you. But I think like once this maledict is on and they cast another spell, like I think she's just dead. So I think by, I think your greatest chance is to use now, I would not have known, to be honest. I would not have known that Phantom Strike does not reach these creeps from here. Um, but I think, like, that would have been my thought, that she can blink to these creeps, and that I want, I need the stun to go off. If they can chase her, they'll kill her. So I think using the stun on one of these creeps or myself, and then running in to try to body block as she runs away, is your best chance at surviving. And at least, even if they kill her, the stun will go off. And it will do a lot of damage to these two guys, which will at least make the lane a bit easier. But instead, like, see, she doesn't have a far blink target, so she just dies. And even if she did blink over here, Maldict was going to kill her. So now Inkswell didn't really do damage to them. And they're just going to be fairly healthy. They're not even going to have to salve if they don't want to. That's where we're going to stop with this one. And I kind of want to point out how that all started with one creep walking under tower. Granted, I think you could have fixed it with this small camp pull, but you see how it like it's all these connection of things where it's like, okay, first they first the lane pushed in a way that I didn't want it to, so I was forced to like look to pull. I didn't pull soon enough. So then I tried to pull the second one, but that wasn't enough. Um all of that. You know? That was fifteen minutes. Uh, I talk so much. So let's just move on. <laughs> Here we are in the second game with uh Spectre Lane leaving again pretty quickly why are we not oh okay i'm gonna point out while we're walking to lane here 
to note the difference. So the last lane was average versus strong lane. So that, yeah, they're probably, they have the advantage on us, but we could get kills if we outplay them a bit. And in fact, we saw that opportunity for a kill with the Witch Doctor that I pointed out. So it was possible to get a kill if we played things out properly. That's why I didn't mind like the Sage's Mask, because it's like, okay, if he pokes them down a bit, maybe he can get some long-term value. In this game, there is no kills. That's not happening. You have a Spectre. It's just Spectre versus Quop and Chen. Chen is a fairly strong hero um, with lots of regen. And by strong, I mean he's like a very healthy hero. And granted, you are getting him low here, but this isn't going to happen in the lane when Queen of Pain is here. And then Queen of Pain is going to have Blink very early. As soon as level 2, really. And uh, she should like hold that skill point to see if she needs it. And then, if not, she'll get it later. But like anytime you go on her, she'll just Blink out of your stun. Blink away from you guys. You'll never kill her. You need your Silence to even attempt to kill her. But that requires a lot of your mana. And even then, I think she could just auto-attack it twice and then blink away. This kill is really difficult to get. Um, so I'm just thinking, like, kills are not happening. All I need to do is survive this lane. And that's why I don't think the Sage's Mask and this regen is so important. Like, I think all you need to do is cast Stroke of Fate to occasionally secure the range creep. And to harass a bit, maybe, when you're, like, full mana. But I just don't think you're gonna, you need to cast a lot of spells in this game. I think you just focus on... Um, trading or securing her xp so i like this you blocked the uh you pulled them a little bit to the side which got you a nice position in lane and see so see this is good this guy's balancing the wave out for the most part oh that was close i think you're doing it by accident but that kept him out for a little bit longer um so this is still passable it was unfortunate that it ran under tower but you know what manageable again same thing where you need to break this tree so that you can see him Getting more. I like that. I would have preferred that to be a headdress, I think. I think we already talked about it in the early video. I won't talk that that much more. But 2 HP. Um, in that starting item video, we saw how this is essentially like two salves over the course of a laning stage, right? And Spectre, like, we just want her to farm. So that's all we need to enable her to do. I don't think the Sage's Mask enables her. I think having a lot of health enables her. Now, Basilius could enable her a little bit in the form of casting daggers, but uh, specifically against this lineup that is such heavy harass, focused on out healing you and then just harassing you a lot, I think the headdress plays a lot of value. Oops, back to you. So here we are. I like this side much more. But you see how this is what I'm talking about with Chen. It just doesn't trade that well. And yeah, you can cast Stroke of Fate to try to make up for it, but he literally is just auto-attacking you and winning this trade. And because of his regen, like 6.1 versus your... Oh, you have a tango going. Hold on. 2.2. So, 4 regen per second is a lot. Every 10 seconds is worth 1 auto attack to him compared to you. Whereas you... Yeah, let's do it that way. Every 10 seconds, this guy gets 60 HP, which is 1 auto attack. And for you to get one auto attack's worth of HP back is like 30 from this guy. Maybe a little less. But you see that big difference, right? That is the power of having a lot of regen. And if you got a headdress to get yourself to a 2.2, then that balances it out a bit. Where now it's only, you know, 15-ish seconds um, per auto attack. Which is still worse than Chen. But that's why we're not looking to trade that much. We're just looking to survive this laning stage and help um, Spectre out. I would have wanted to pull this first camp and then block it, like we talked about. Because Chen... Okay, we're going to see when he does it. He's not level 2 yet. This is why you don't need to block it right away, because he can't, he can't do anything to you quite yet. I do like this. You guys kind of go for a kill. Um... Unfortunately, though, I mean, he does get away, but I kind of feel like Spectre should probably just be here in general. Doesn't necessarily need to go for this kill. If she was, if you were level two, I think it could be possible, but you weren't. Now, the reason I want you to pull this camp earlier at one minute and possibly even two minutes, right? You just chase this guy out. So let's talk about that. I don't think you need to come here and harass this Queen of Pain. Like we said, she's not dying. It's just straight up not happening. 
And even if she's low, she can pretty much stay here because eventually Chen will return and heal her up. And, and uh, like, even if you go on her, she doesn't have Blink yet, which I think is a mistake. I think she should save a skill point to get Blink. But eventually she will have Blink and it's just not happening. So harassing her is not doing a lot because it's not setting up a kill. And it's going to, like, she's just going to heal it up. That's part of why it's not going to set up a kill. So I think just pulling repeatedly is your answer. To deny XP, to secure yourself a little bit more, to let her get solo XP here. Um, if you had pulled at 1 minute 18 and possibly killed off this camp, and then pulled again after Chen died or he returned to base, and you had, like, this whole, like, he's just getting back to lane. So you had, like, a minute to pull uncontested where Queen of Pain could not have stopped you. So you could even do a second pull and now block the camp. This guy is about to approach um, level two and then we're gonna see why it was so important to block this camp. So you just stacked it, which I don't think was necessary. This camp can handle half pulls and even if you do a full pull, um, you can still kill off at least two of your own creeps and then get this full experience. So I don't think you had to stack it. Um, especially at this point, if you had stacked at two minutes, that might've been okay. But since it's three minutes and you know, Chen is about to hit, um, the skill. Well, I'll wait for him to do it and then I'll show you. Now he has level two. Gonna take Harpy Stormcrafter. Let's take a look at Chen's ability. This is about, this is probably going to be the end of the replay, honestly, soon. Once we explain Chen, Chen is a unique case. So I don't blame you or anyone else for not fully understanding like how Chen works, but that's why I think this is a great learning opportunity here. Health minimum, 700. So the creep is going to boost up to 700 health. Let's look at you. You have 680. This creep is going to have more health than you. Has slightly less health than Spectre. Slightly more than Queen of Pain. Like This creep is a hero at 700 HP. And depending on the creep, they may or may not have armor. But two armor is not bad. You have three. Let's look back at the spell. Okay. Um, 700 health. Move speed. Bumps it up by 10. Which... Not the hugest deal, but 320 movement speed is more than you. Is more than many starting heroes, in fact. Although the Harpy is a relatively fast one. So, like, the Hill Troll only would have had 280, which is quite slow. And then what else? Eight bonus damage. The Harpy had 33, which is quite a lot. And now it's getting bumped up to eight. Or bumped up by eight to 41. Which is, essentially, very close to you. This hero, hero that has... Um, 41 damage, 2 armor, 320 movement speed, and 700 health. Like, in a 1v1, you would struggle against just this creep. You were struggling against Chen in a 1v1, and now it's going to be two of them. The Harpy, unfortunately for you, is pretty much the best level 1 creep he could possibly get. Look at this spell. 140 damage that bounces around, so it could possibly hit both the heroes in lane. It only costs 50 mana. Now, this one doesn't have a bunch of mana, but they have a Crystal Maiden, giving it mana regen. Sometimes they'll also buy Ring of Basilius on Chen so that this creep will get more mana. The point is, this is a lot of damage. You would lose in a 1v1 versus a Harpy Stormcrafter that casts Chain Lightning, I think. Or like, it would be very close. Um, or at least a Harpy Stormcrafter that is boosted by Chen. Now, what other creeps could it get? These creeps, also quite strong, but don't have the spell. These creeps, strong. This one has no armor, at least. Um, oh, that's the last thing I want to point out. So level one, it can um, persuade up to level three creeps. So over here, can't get this guy. Can't get this guy. Let's move on. What are some other camps in the game? Can't get this one. Could get this guy, but only eight damage. So if we add another eight, it's at 16. That's like, that's whatever. It doesn't hurt that much. It has no armor. So we're probably not killing it very quickly because it still has 700 HP and it's decently fast. But like, it doesn't do much damage. A centaur, he could take the mini one, um, but they don't have too much damage, and they're melee. So it's like, it's annoying, not a big deal. Can't take this guy. What about these guys from the hard camp? We're only considering hard and small camps here because that's what we would spawn. Can't take the main troll, but you could get these guys. It'd be a little annoying. They have a decent amount of attack damage. Not too bad, though, compared to some of the small camps. You wouldn't see the medium camp. Bowl Assassin is one of the best things he could get. 33 damage is quite high. Decent stats, similar to the Harpy. And this Envenomed Weapon is extremely annoying because it lasts 10 seconds on you, does 2 damage per second, so that's 20 damage. 
But then it reduces your regen, which makes all your tangos, all your salves, everything worth less. So if he just constantly pokes you with his vol, it just makes his style of play, which is to win the regen war, way easier. Because now all of your regen is worth a lot less. We're not going to worry about medium camps. He doesn't really walk over there. I think that actually covers all the different possibilities. Oh, these guys can't get this guy. But we saw these in the, min in the medium camp, right? Um, so yeah. If he doesn't have a creep, though, what does this spell do? It doesn't do anything. If he doesn't have a creep, it doesn't do anything. He's just this healing aura, which is annoying, but it's not as oppressive as having two heroes, essentially, auto-attacking you, occasionally casting spells, or maybe having some aura, like mana aura from this one, the Vol Assassin, the Ghost Camp that slows you, the Kobolds all all awful so we don't have to worry about that but the point is you don't want chen to get a creep that he likes which is possibly a harpy possibly a vol possibly a ghost you'll notice a lot of small camps really good this guy not that great um because it's level four you can't get him so this hard camp he can't even make use of this hard camp he could get the centaur but like we said not that great uh this hard camp can get one of the can get this guy, but like we said, not that great. I can't believe there's not a storm. It's not one of those bird camps, but again, those are melee and they don't do that much damage, so they're okay. Blocking the small camp really reduces his ability to do anything. And if this is a camp like the Hellbears that he can't make use of, he now has to go walk like all the way over here to go find a creep, or he has to walk to his own jungle to go find a creep. That is a huge pain for Chen. Um, and it just leaves the lane 1v1 or 2v1, and then you could maybe do hard pulls or something. So I think blocking the camp versus Chen is something very worthwhile to do. And uh, that's kind of all I care about in this lane. After this, like if we look at last hits, Spectre, passable, all things considered in this game. Uh, XP is, again, somewhat passable. But see how Queen of Pain is quite high compared to Chen, because Chen is a hero that doesn't need to take a lot of XP, and because he's over here. So this was bad. I would, once you saw him, well, actually, I don't know if you saw him, but if you see him do this, you do need to, like, steal this camp with your Q. And I would, I would care more about the camp than even going for the kill, like, getting the gold from these guys, because I don't think I can kill him, because he's a very fast guy, and I'm only 290. Although I didn't mind that attempt. Like, this part, but then I think chasing over here is not so good. Just, like, kill off this camp so that he can't get it. Yeah, see, she just blinks away. Let's rewind that. This kill is just straight up, like, never happening. And she has to play safe for a bit, but then ultimately she can just return and the lane does not change. Let's move on to the next one. Last game here. You are leaving lane pretty early again. Same deal. Now, this is a lane where I may have even considered asking one person to come top with us because Slark Grimstroke can get a kill. Especially, so this is a weird, I guess you don't know who's being the offlane. That's part of it. Um, I would guess Pudge is at least in the offlane. And then it's either like a Pudge offlaner with sniper support or a Ricky offlane with like a Pudge support. And in very rare cases, like this game, you have a DP offlane with Pudge support. I don't blame you guys for not knowing that. Now, what you're doing here, I like that you came out lane early, but you have to remember why you have a ward. Later, you will place it here. I saw that. But by coming out here, they can see you from here. If we go to Radiant, they can see you when you stand here, which means they will see you have a ward. And later when you place it, they will know he had a ward. It is now placed. They might not know specifically where it is, but they will be thinking about it. They will realize it's up here. The enemy support, for example, may be thinking, okay, they have a ward top and the other ward's probably mid, so there's probably no ward bottom. Like, he is getting useful information out of seeing... Or, sorry, that's not your... Who's their support? Here, Warlock. That's what he's thinking, right? Um, just knowing in the what general part of the map what team has a support or what... What part of the general map is a ward is at is already useful information for a team, even if they don't know specifically where it is. 
So I would place this ward before walking out here. And if you want to save the duration on it, you, like you didn't want to place it too early, just physically drop the ward back here. I don't think you can do that with when you hold a sentry. So maybe you could pass it to your Slark and he'll, he'll drop it in the back. But either way, you can't walk out here with it or like they'll know. I would just place it. The uh, duration like wouldn't be that big of a deal. Like another 40 seconds. If you go the first four minutes without pud choking you, like that's fine. So I would be aware of that. Thirty seconds to go. Why is it? There we go. And then you're gonna get stroke of fate again, but I think you could get inkswell because you could actually just kill this pudge. Now you didn't see sniper, so I can understand why you guys were a little hesitant. But I really feel like you should have at least contested this rune, and possibly even like to test if sniper is up here. Just run over here. You know or like once you see once you see pudge walk out so your friend should see pudge here the only reason it's risky to walk out here when pudge is here is because if he waits here and then like hooks you under tower but once you see he's out here it is safe to approach from this way and fight fight these guys and if sniper is here then he is going to show and then you have a chance to back away and that way you don't have to fight the rune but if you don't do that and you wait for this rune to spawn, you're never going to get a chance to like see if snipers here. Um, but I would still take that risk, honestly, because many mids will wait here. They won't be like playing super aggressively. I don't know if you guys had a deeper reason to not come out here, but I really think this is a kill. Pudge is super weak. Like, what is this? He has an orb of venom. This guy has zero armor and is a slow hero. Slark steals stat. He's faster. He has solid base damage. Every attack does an extra 20 damage, essentially, because you steal their stat and they lose 20 HP when they lose their strength. He gains attack speed and armor. They lose attack speed and armor. You have you would get your ink swell in this case, in my opinion, and you're auto-attacking a decent amount. Like, I think this is just a straight-up kill on Pudge, and I don't see how she does anything. Like, even though Spirit Siphon is a decent 1v1 or, like, a 2v2 spell, she has one charge, and at level 1, it's going to do about... 80 damage and granted it's going to heal her for 80 damage so you could consider that like a 160 swing where you take damage and she heals this guy who does like what considering armor but then the 20 hp he does like 70 damage per auto attack and he's gaining attack speed that's like two auto attacks that equivalent that equal this spell maybe three this guy is like I don't know. I think this is just like a full aggro full aggro moment. When I see this Pudge, I'm like, let's just run at him. Do not give him this rune. Because like those last two lanes, PA, that was an average lane where it's like kind of risky. Spectre lane. Kills are not happening. It's okay to pass up on this. But this one, you guys are strong. You should be looking for kills. Especially if your buddy had started with a Orb of Venom. That was definitely a kill if you land that attack on him. Um, like run around the side here and hit him. It's okay not to start Orb of Venom and then buy one later. Um, and especially against Pudge, you still would have killed him without an Orb of Venom, I think. But Orb of Venom in this lane would be very good because you guys are strong. And because you started with your Stroke of Fate, you should just be thinking about trying to get ranged last hits. So like, we'll slow down a bit. So right here, this creep looking to, like she, like what she did, she used her spell to secure the range creep and then denied yours. So that is a huge, huge deal for you guys. I know at this point it doesn't seem like a huge deal because it's just like a 30 swing, but it adds up. In a lane, all you need is to be one level up, and that gives you like one extra spell point, and that is like you guys hitting level two when they're level one is this massive moment for you guys to kill them. But at level two and level two, honestly, because they're weak, it's still a huge time for you guys. But in other lanes where it's like strong versus weak, like say that uh, Mars and Witch Doctor, them hitting level two is a big deal. And sometimes just being level 2, 30 experience faster is like all you need. So getting her getting her range creep and then denying yours is a big deal. Especially when you're just sitting with a stroke of fate and a sage's mask. That is the time you're looking to cast that spell. This is a good camp for pulling the first wave. The next one coming up, 118. Ghosts are very good at it. Um, yeah, look at this ghost. If Ch Imagine Chen takes this guy. 
so much damage. This passive, really good. Good movement speed. Decent armor for a neutral creep. And then 700 HP, wild. Do not let Chen get those for free, if possible. He's usually a 5, though, so it's kind of uncommon to see him as a 4. So this is another time. Like, now they've denied two range creeps. And if we look at the XP, like, where are you? You you backed away a little bit, so it's uh, so Slark is up there, which I'm okay with. But, like, you see how Pudge is ahead of you, and, like, she's not that far behind Slark. That is as a direct result of they're getting these denies. Playing the lane. Imagine if you had pulled this camp, though. The last one. Did a half pull. Ghost, you can do two half pulls. You could have half pulled this wave, the third wave, and now half pulled this fourth wave as well. And you can kill all of them off. Or you could half pull this wave and then stack on this time. Like, don't pull this wave. And then stack at two minutes. And then do a full wave pull on the next one with the uh, whatever camp you get. And so, like, now you're at the point where you have this stacked camp. But do you see how by doing a half pull and then stacking, you would have denied two creeps? Which is even a bigger deny, okay? I'm, I'm using the same term. When you deny in lane, it gives 50% XP to these guys. If you get them killed out of range, like, you don't even get the, the deny. The creep just dies over here, and it's not here. They don't get any XP. So, essentially, one creep dying here out of XP range is worth two denies in lane. So imagine how hard it would be to deny all four of these creeps. It would be very difficult. But if you do a half pull and they just die out of range, that is the same. It's the same level of XP. Even more, considering that the range creep is worth a bit more than the melee creeps. So, like, see how this, this is an opportunity that you're missing? And, like, you weren't really needed here at this time. Slark is very safe in this lane. He's not likely to die. Especially now that he's level 2 and has pounce. Like, if he gets hooked, he'll just pounce. Death Prophet's not going to get silence anytime soon. He's very safe. You don't need to be here. You can keep thinking about pulling. And if Pudge comes to contest... Let's see if he ever does it. And I'll show you what you can sort of do. Okay, so this is great, actually. Yeah, you just kill him. That's one thing you can do. The other thing you, you can do, if you hadn't pulled the wave right and you see him walking over, you, like, stand over here and... You, like, walk up and try to pull. And if he wants to harass, or if he wants to stop the pull because he's a melee creep or melee hero, he has to walk in and hit them, and then all of these creeps are going to auto-attack him, like, four times. And it's going to do, like, 200 damage to him because he has no armor. So, you don't have to be scared of pulling. See how that did, like, that was half the Spirit Siphon duration on you? Look how little this did to you. I mean, it wasn't nothing, but... Her auto attack is, like, what does a lot of damage. Spirit Siphon, level 1, not that great against you guys. I'm trying to point out, like, how strong your lane is compared to these two. And so the fact that they are equal and debatably even ahead of you is not good. You should be rocking these guys. Free kills. You see how annoying that ghost is? how much damage you're taking from these guys pay attention to your health okay 500 500 when they start switching to you they're missing a bit uphill they did almost 200 damage to you it's these ghosts man they do a ton but then these trolls also do a decent amount so doing that trick against Pudge is a great way to get free damage off. But then also, if they ever aggro to you, it's really important to just get out and not like trade like here a bit. Well, in this case, you were going for last hit, so I'm okay with it. But in other times, if they were, say, full health, don't try to like fight them a bit. Just get out. They do so much damage. Yeah, I think that's about it for this lane. Slark is a hero you can just like leave alone for the most part in this lane because they just don't threaten him. Um, and you can just focus on pulling the entire time and let Slark get solo XP in lane while you get some XP from cramp camps 
and deny XP from the offlaner, which will set Slark up to hit six very early compared to this guy. This was a uh, another example of how... I don't know why I went back so... Dang it! I did all that, and then I still missed it. Okay. This is an example of why the creeps just attack whatever's closest. See how they switch from you, and they just went to this guy? So if you want to interrupt this pull, you just have to walk into these creeps and stay stay near them until these creeps back away. Now in the end, you just walk over here, so this is not a big deal. I think this is good. It's okay that you died because Slark got a kill, and he's here. Look, he's getting this creep. All great stuff. Ooh, nice. At this point, I would leave. I don't think you need to be with Slark anymore. I would physically walk bottom. Sneak peek for future videos. But Slark is just not going to die. And if he needs help, you can TP up here. You guys haven't been playing aggressively for kills anyways at this point. So I don't know why you would think like, oh, I need to be up here to get more kills. It's true, but like you've missed some opportunities for it already at this point. So at this part of the game, it's now like, let just let Slark just speed up on his own. He's totally fine. Let's go mess with this enemy, Ricky. And in fact, Pudge is coming down here. You don't know this yet. But messing with Ricky, who's having a tough time already, Slark is going to be free farming. She is struggling a bit. She cannot keep up with him in a 1v1. So Slark is doing great. Ricky is going to be harassed. And you can now use Stroke of Fate freely down here because stealing farm from your carry, bad. Stealing farm from your offlaner, totally fine if you're accomplishing some harass. So coming down here, casting your spells, getting... Admittedly, Inkswell is hard to land on Ricky, but you have a lion who has two stuns, or he will when he gets this at level whatever. Oh, there we go. It was... He does have it. Okay, so two stuns plus Inkswell, like all really strong in combination together. And then you stroke a fate against, um, you know, two heroes, possibly three now that Pudge is down here. That builds up a lot of damage. And you can just put on a ton of pressure. And in a 3v3, you guys win, I think. Warlock's pretty good at 3v3s, but Pudge, if he doesn't land a hook, not good at 3v3s. So, like, see how low these guys, like, these two are a kill if you're down here with uh, Inkswell plus stroke of fate. And this guy, who will just have all these treants auto-attacking, and his auto-attack does a lot of damage as well. Sprout to set up Inkswell. Like, what are you doing up here? You're pulling, which is okay, but relatively, you could be getting kills. So yeah, I think that's it. Um, These were all quite long, so I guess this will just be its own video. Let's do two replays. So let's cover someone else's, probably. Yeah, I hope this was helpful. I think we got to see how we essentially got to see all three lanes. We saw a strong lane, an average lane, and a weak lane, and how we approach them differently and think differently. So, like, your starting items in this strong lane was okay. Funny enough, you need the Basilius the least with Slark because he just doesn't use mana except when going for kills or escaping. So, in general, his mana issues are not a big deal. He doesn't use them to farm in the lane, whereas Spectre and PA do. So you don't quite need the Basilius against him, but the Basilius start was safest with him. But I would say it's okay still because, like, ideally you guys would have been going for kills, and that way he would have used his mana up, and so it's okay to um, make sure you have mana and then to make sure he has mana. Um, but because this is a strong lane, you should be looking for kills. Then the PA lane, like, considering a bit more regen because it's a average lane and you may need that. And then the Spectre lane, considering a full focus on just regening. Like, who cares if you have mana? You're not going to be using it. Like, you'll never do anything to Quop and Chen that makes it worth buying mana items. Just need to stay alive in that lane. So, yeah. I hope that was helpful. And uh, I almost forgot to answer your question about whether it is okay to, against strong offlaners, pull the creep wave under your tower to farm it. Um, and then pull to reset the equilibrium as a way to secure last hits for your carry, whether your friend was correct or whether he was full of it, as you put it. The answer is a little complicated, but we can generalize it. And I think we've covered enough in this guide where I think I can explain it and you'll understand this without me having to show a bunch of examples. If I agree with your friend 
in about like 60 to 70 percent of cases where your friend's idea is correct in the most in most situations as a general concept but you have to you have to think a little further out as well the part about pulling to reset the equilibrium that is the really important part of this statement is how will equilibrium be affected when the creeps come under tower i've shown plenty of examples where the first wave walks under tower and then like we see how it plays out over here and the reason that's so bad is because here is safe for the carry and here is not so for the first wave i will say i think it's always a bad idea in pubs in general to allow the creeps to come under tower i think there are very few situations that would require a coordinated effort where you let them come under your tower to hit a fast level two and go for a kill and then push this tower like a play intended to be made within the first minute and 30 seconds that kills them when you hit level two and they're level one and then this tower denies a lot of xp that is something that i think you need to have a team planned around this and it requires specific heroes and specific coordination with your team which you'll notice very rarely happens in pubs so we're just going to say, as a general rule, the first wave under tower, always bad. After that, it depends. The first wave is just a good way. Is really, well, what am I trying to say here? It's not really different from other waves in the fact that if you have the equilibrium here and then suddenly they enter under your tower, it's going to push. It's particularly bad on the first wave because that's the very beginning of the game. So you have no way to try to adjust like say with the neutral camps so your friend's idea to just pull after that to balance out the equilibrium is okay if you're not being contested if you have the right camps we saw kobolds absolutely awful we saw like these guys can sort of handle a first full wave but ultimately many of them if you try to do a full pull will still leave one or two creeps alive and ultimately, when you have one or two creeps join in this way, for example, and in fact, there are two range creeps here. Range creeps are the worst case where they push the most, and then these extend the duration of a lane, but do not push it that much. So this will ultimately push into us. So when you do a pull with, say, one camp and leave even one creep alive, that adds a little bit of pull into your lane or a push. And now if it's one melee creep, maybe you can handle that. If it's a melee and a ranged and you end up with two ranged and lanes, it's very difficult to handle that. And ultimately, you have to ask yourself, if I secure, say, one wave under this tower, but it pushes the wave up here for two more waves, where it is now too dangerous for me to come up and to secure these last hits, was that worth it? Would it have been better to have three waves right here where I get contested for a bit, but I'm able to get like, say, 75% of them and I have to use a couple tangles, tangos, or uh, pull that first wave under tower, get every last hit, don't have to use any tangos, but then miss 50% or more of the next two waves and then take a lot of harass where it's dangerous. Pulling requires the support to be over here, which means if your carry has to be up here, like they might get zoned off out of more than 50%. If they can't approach the lane. So that's why pulling to reset the equilibrium is not always okay. Um, and that's why it comes down to a lot of context. Where like that Slark game we were just looking at. You could totally leave Slark alone like way over here. And I would be fine with that. And you could just pull the whole time. Spectre up here by herself. That is a huge issue. That game where your friend was PA. Leaving her alone like even here. That was an issue. Where she could die alone. And pulling, like, you can't just reset that because she'll probably just die in that time. Um, so you have to ask yourself, can my carry be alone? How will this um, pulling under tower affect it? Here, the reason I was paused here was to show, um, I'll just let this play. Sometimes the tower killing off the wave will be okay. So one tower there was fine because they already had more. And here, it's pushing into us. And tower killing these is just going to reset. Look, these next two creeps are going to meet totally fine. And now equilibrium is right here. So then those three creeps coming under tower, which would have been like a massive failure in the first wave because it results in this huge push. That was okay because those were the only three creeps in the, in the lane, really. Our creeps were already dead. And so that when they came under tower and died, it just reset the equilibrium. 
And that's what you have to ask yourself in regards to your question of when is it okay to do that? Spectre is a great example where it's generally okay to allow the creeps to come under tower if it means she can get those last hits. But do ask yourself, what is the long-term effect of this? Is this going to result in the creep wave being up here for the next like three or four creep waves? Then maybe it would have just been better to fight for about 75% of the creeps here instead of getting 100% here and then only 50% for the next like four waves. And then like say this camp is blocked or something or it's dead or whatever or like this camp pull is hard to do right where i mean it's easy to do this way but it's easily contested and it's getting all over the place so yeah that's the answer to your question i hope if that's not clear feel free to ask again and ask for some clarifications um but it does depend on what heroes so like specter's okay that start game i would say it's not okay you want the lane to be here it's generally beneficial to you to do this so you have to ask yourself, why am I breaking away from this? Like, is this so bad that we can't do this? Am I losing so many creeps just fighting here that it has to come under tower where it's safe? And will I be able to pull to actually reset equilibrium enough? And can my carry be alone while I'm doing that? Some carries can even be dove under tower and killed, like if the game is bad enough. So that all plays into this. Yeah, thanks for watching. I hope that was helpful. Ask any questions that weren't answered? I can never think of an ending, and I just trail off until I suddenly 